Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So I regret to inform you that the majority of people who watch this video and who don't are gonna die when the shit hits the fan. Now, I'm probably gonna die too, but for reasons not specified in this video. One of those reasons is the fact that I now have 430,000 people that may well be beating down my door after the shit hits the fan. Referring to my subscriber count, thank you very much. Let's take it to five, 5.5 million. Yeah, 5 million, I hope, in a few years. But uh, please kick, click that like button. It helps out and all that, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, let's get to the point here. The reason why most people are simply not gonna make it is because anytime you want something right now, you can have it. You wanna buy a 70 inch flat screen OLED TV in the middle of the freaking night, 3.30 in the morning, Walmart's open, okay? You want a uh, mocha chai latte at 5 a.m., you can go get that, okay? You want somebody or something any time of the day, you can have it in our society. All you gotta do is swipe right, swipe left, make a phone call, okay? That's all you have to do. Unfortunately, this is not going to translate well in a shit hits a fan situation because what we've become is a generation of docile, submissive, domesticated, flaccid individuals, okay? For lack of better terms. And we are being propped up on all fronts by the technology that keeps us alive. Look, most people alive today of the 7 billion, remember that for thousands of years, there was only ever hundreds of millions to maybe a billion people on the planet up until like 200 years ago. So these 5 billion extra people, can you seriously see these 5 billion extras, maybe I'm one of them, maybe I'm not, I don't know. I like to think I'm not, but maybe I am. Could you see these 5 billion Darwinian extras as surviving, you know, in past times, okay? Hunter-gatherer times or horticultural times. You know how we progress through various levels? Uh, anthropologists uh, call it subsistence patterns. So we start off as hunter-gatherers, you know, trying to spear mastodons. And then we move up to the pastoral uh, subsistence pattern. That's like the, the Maasai, you know, who have the cattle and they're nomadic, but they have, uh, they keep animals, animal husbandry. And then you move on to horticulture where you start laying roots and you realize, oh, we can produce more food if we, if we stay still. And then you get into agriculture. And now we're gonna be getting into the Franken food generation, which is basically if we want something, we can just create it, even though it might be toxic, poisonous, and have long-term health effects. We're gonna create it, you know, we're gonna 3D print our food, Beyond Meat or whatever the hell it's gonna be. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that people are so soft nowadays because they don't have to wait for anything. I'm gonna tell you that the key to drive, the key to having drive is to deprive. If you are lacking drive in your life, if you're lacking motivation to do something or you find yourself in this latent state of depression where you don't enjoy your life or you have disdain for the world. The problem is, is that you're not deprived enough. The problem is, is you can just walk down to the store and buy whatever you want. You don't have to earn it. You see, the problem is, is that abundance leads to depreciation, no matter what it is. If you have too much of something, it becomes depreciated. If there was too much gold in the world, it would be depreciated, okay? If there was gold everywhere, it would have no value. And the same thing is true for stuff. In the modern day, we can have whatever we want, and thus it has no value. That's why kids don't really appreciate much nowadays. If I had what my kids had, if I had one fiftieth of the toys and the distractions that my kids have, I would have been, I would have been, my head would have exploded with, with joy and happiness when I was a kid because I had none of that stuff, okay? I had to use my imagination with my two toys, my two, you know, uh, army figurines or whatever the heck it was that I had. You know, I had to, I could make that work. I had to stretch that out, right? So kids nowadays, they have so much abundance, they don't appreciate anything. And the same thing with people. So they become docile, they become... Uh, you know, submissive and, and compliant and just overly domesticated. And as a result of this, when times get tough, these people are gonna ball up in the corner and cry like little bitches 
because they've never had to work anything for anything in their lives. Now myself personally, some of you might recall from watching my videos in past times that I never had a, a you know, a silver spoon upbringing. You know, I grew up in the bad side of the town. Yes, in Canada, we have bad sides of towns. You know, when I was a kid, I had to steal food in order to eat. It was that bad, okay? You know, I had a few people who looked out for me and that is the key, by the way. You know, a lot of people say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But if you don't have anybody to show you unconditional love, you know, it's gonna be very hard for you to excel. But if you just have one person in your life, and this is, you know, for all you people out there who don't think you can have an impact, if you can just have one person in your life who shows you unconditional love and unconditional regard, you know, you can take that really shitty situation and turn it into something great. And in my opinion, most great minds and great people come from places of poverty or great adversity. And I would never ever for a million years trade in my past and my upbringing as shitty as it was in the moment and as much as I hated it in the moment, in hindsight, I would never, and foresight, I would never trade that for the lifestyle that I envied that the other kids have because it's made me into the person I am today. Okay, it's given me the drive to exceed. I know that the abundance is an illusion, okay? Because I've been in the bottom rung. I know what it's like to go hungry and to starve and to go without. If you don't know what that's like, if you don't know what the feeling of deprivation is like, it's going to be, well, for one, you're not gonna appreciate anything. Nothing's appreciated. If there's gold everywhere, it's depreciated, right? If you had everything given to you growing up, then you don't appreciate stuff. And so what I would encourage you to do, if you want to get this drive that I'm talking about, if you've been deprived of this experience of deprivation, sorry about the double negative, but if you have been deprived of the experience of not having shit and having to struggle, if you haven't had to do that, you can self-impose that in your life. And uh, one of the things you can do is one of the things I've been doing lately. I'm not sure if you guys have noticed, I'm looking a little gaunt and fatigued. And part of the reason is because I'm at an extreme calorie deficit. I've been doing uh, intermittent fasting for the last two months or so, and I've lost about 20 pounds. Now, intermittent fasting is nothing new to me. I've done it off and on for about 10 years before it was really, well, right around the time when it started to get popular, uh, there was a little known YouTuber that actually set it all off. <laughs> and, you know, basically that caught wind with some of the bigger channels and it, from there it became mainstream and popular. But I've been doing it since back in the day and I can tell you that there's nothing like fasting all day and then having a meal at the end of the day. There's gonna be so many benefits to you mentally and physically. You gotta understand that 10,000 years ago, okay, we were clawing through the jungles and through the tundra trying to find calories. And I'm talking about, you know, like hunter gatherers who are just shredded, you know, like just ripped, just hungry, knowing that if they did not get this kill, they were going to die. Every day was a life or death situation. So that's, that's how you compel drive in a person. You know, you don't need motivation to get out of bed in the morning when you have to get out of bed, because if you don't, you're gonna get your face chewed off by a saber-toothed tiger. When your life depends on something, you approach it much differently. And what I found with doing this intermittent fasting over the years is that my mental acuity, my focus, my energy levels, they all go up. And this, it all harkens back to when we were, you know, in a more primitive form, when we had to go out and do the hunt, our bodies realized, and this is what happens when you, when you starve, this is why after around 24 hours of fasting, your brain power actually increases because your body's like, oh shit, you know, we got to get some food. So I need to be firing all, on all cylinders here to make sure that we don't lose this kill because it could mean a life or death situation. You need to understand that the human body is over a million years old, depending on how back you want to go in the evolutionary tree. You know, obviously our species, I think it was like, what, 100,000 or something like that. Regardless, that's a long time compared to the advancements that we've made in technology in the last 200 years of the green revolution and all that, that have helped us basically not have to care where our food comes from. 
But prior to that, for the majority of our evolution, okay, we are operating on the principle of scarcity, game theory. We're competing for the limited amount of resources in the environment. And as a result of that, you know, we were basically wired to when we get into that starvation mode, you know, our, our body adapts, uh, allocates certain resources to parts of our body, namely our brain, that we're going to need in order to successfully hunt an animal. So if you can translate that into modern practice, then uh, what I found is that like right now, for instance, I just broke the fast, but up until this point, you know, I was, I had a lot of energy. I had a lot of, because digestion takes so much energy. People don't realize that. It's that the majority of the calories you burn in a day are going to be burned through metabolic processes. So that's why you feel so sluggish after you eat because your body is putting all that energy into breaking down that food. So what I'm trying to say is that if you are experiencing what I'm talking about, if you have that fight club syndrome, you know, like you feel like your life is meaningless and you have no great war to fight in this generation, you know, the great depression is our lives type thing. If you're in that state of mind, the key is deprivation. The key is self-imposed struggle. The guys with the wingsuits jumping off cliffs get exactly what I'm saying. Now they go to the extreme because they're also adrenaline junkies and that is an addiction just like uh, endorphins are an addiction. And you know, that's why you get that thing called runner's high. And runner's high is actually a good example to understand what I'm talking about with fasting. Because when you're running, if you run a certain distance, it's gonna be tedious, it's gonna be hard. But you get to this point in the run, if you don't have any injuries and you know your gas tank is relatively full, you get to this point in the run where you start to have these euphoric feelings. That's when the body is sending its own painkillers, its endorphins, it's flooding your brain with these endorphins because for whatever reason it goes into survival mode and it thinks, oh, this must be an important thing this guy's running from or whatever, there must be a reason why this guy's running. So I need to, you know, give him the neurochemistry he needs to keep it up. And what the body will do is flood you with endorphins so you don't feel any pain. Now this is both good and bad because it's good in the moment, but you could potentially injure yourself because the endorphins are gonna mask pain. If you're doing, uh, if you're doing overuse of certain muscular groups or something, then, you know, you could potentially be doing damage. But in the moment, you know, you get that euphoric experience, you get that, those endorphins and the same thing kind of happens with fasting is it's really hard for the first part of the day but once you get rolling with it and depending on you know how you time your cycle maybe you're fasting mostly at night you know i do a 16 hour fast eight hour eating window actually it's more like a six hour eating window and the rest of the day fast and what this is going to do is it's going to allow your body to to uh, really deplete all of the the energy that is in your stomach use all that energy up and then start tapping into your fat stores so this is why you can consume 2500 calories across a 24-hour period and spread it out and you're actually probably going to lose less weight than you would if you were to intermittent fast for 16 hours and they eat that 2,500 calories. In addition to that, you train yourself to delayed gratification. You train yourself to having to postpone gratification. Cause I can tell you right now that in a shit hits the fan situation where we go to an evolutionary throwback and we go down, you know, we regress down the social evolution and the economic evolution. And we go back to, you know, barter or whatever the case might be. You know, if we're talking about a full blown Mad Max scenario, you know, things aren't going to be abundant and you're going to appreciate things more because they're going to be more rare. Technology has afforded us the luxury of abundance, even though you might call it a hollow nutrient deficient, you know, mass produced abundance, which is just kind of superficial. It's still abundance. Okay. It's still filler calories, you know, and it's for most people, they're perfectly fine with it. Even though, you know, myself personally, I will go on these kicks, especially during bulking season, which I call winter, where I will 
find myself for three or four weeks at a time consuming fast food because I get locked into this vicious cycle and perhaps some of you can relate to this. I get lost in this vicious cycle of dopamine from the taste. And every time you, you consume fast food, it gives you that little spike of dopamine and you feel good for a little while, but then you feel like shit afterwards. Then you feel more depressed because you feel more sluggish, you're nutrient deprived, you don't have all the good food nutrients that you would get from eating good food. So you don't have the brain capacity to discern what's what. So you're more likely to make a shitty decision in the future. And that shitty decision happens to be eating more fast food. And it's a vicious downward cycle, you know, and you're just slogging from one shitty meal to the next. And I'll get in those patterns and it's hard to get out. And just like intermittent fasting, it's hard to start, but it's important for so many reasons. Because if you look at people, even from like the 1970s, man, like if you look at people in New York City in the 1970s, just go on some of these older videos, even going back further, I was, I was I like watching these videos of, you know, like 1920s. I think the oldest uh, known video footage is somewhere in the late 1800s. Go look at those people. There are zero overweight people. So what I'm saying essentially is that the value of things is measured in terms of the sacrifices you have to make to get it. You know, one of the biggest fears I have as a parent is not that I can't provide for my family because quite frankly, I'm a workaholic. I work 20 hours a day, nonstop. I will work three minimum wage jobs, never mind minimum wage jobs. I will work for less than minimum wage if, if it means, you know, providing for my family. That's not what concerns me. I will do whatever it takes. But what concerns me more is that my kids are gonna have it too good. And this is something which, you know, really keeps me up at night. I'm not just saying this because it's a trendy thing to say. I'm legitimately concerned that if I provide my kids too many luxuries in their life, that they're, it's going to make them soft. It's going to make them weak willed. Okay. And they're not going to have the drive to achieve shit because they're, they're going to, it's going to depreciate. You give your kids too much. It's going to be depreciated. Now, one thing I will say about the young generation, because they get harped on a lot and a lot of people say, oh, they're not going to survive, shit hits the fan. If you're young, you know, I mean, if you're on the early side of 25, you, you have a lot more neuroplasticity than a person who's old, okay? And that goes a long way. So even if you were reared in a, a household where you, you had a silver spoon in your mouth and you didn't have to really work for much and you were telling your parents off and you were calling the shots, even if you were birthed from that environment, there's still a lot of hope for you if you're young, you know? And even if you're old, through deprivation, that's the cure. That, if you want to get your drive, you must learn to deprive. If you want the drive, you must deprive. I don't know how I'm gonna, maybe I'll put that on a t-shirt, you know? I'm sure somebody's gonna steal that now. Lots of people like to copy this YouTube channel. You know, there's a couple channels out there, I'll make a video and then, lo and behold, three weeks later, they got a video on the same, same topic. Anyways, I guess that's a form of flattery, so I should just take it as a compliment. Now to tie this all into prepping and survivalism. Now to tie this all into prepping and survivalism, what I'm saying is that there's 7 billion people on the planet right now, and there's only so many seats at the egalitarian table, at the hunter-gatherer table. If we go back, if society collapses for whatever reason, then, you know, it's a game of musical chairs and there's going to be a lot of people who are going to get cut out and it's going to be reverting to natural law uh, away from the artificial law that we created. When I say natural law, I'm talking about Darwinian survival of the fittest, survival of the wittest, uh, natural selection, those type of things. Those are going to be the determining factors for the, for the evolution there henceforth. Whereas right now, those factors are not relevant. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're a woman or a man or, or where you come from, you know, which, you know, because we control the climate, you know, even your complexion and your, you know, because you got to think the reason why we are racially different is because we're adapted to different climates. And I made a video once where I was talking about that very thing where, you know, if we did regress 
down the evolutionary tree because of some major cataclysmic event that uh, different body types are, are adapted to different regions of the planet. So your survivability, as much as we don't want to admit that our biology plays a role in you know our survival skills and capabilities, it does. So, I mean, that's, that's just something to consider whether you're in the Northern or Southern hemisphere, you know, closer to the equator, further away from the equator, those things might actually be a factor if you're talking about the one-off low probability, full blown Mad Max shit hits the fan event. You know, like myself personally, because I have a, a darker complexion, I might be more tailored towards a warmer climate. That's just, you know, it's biology, right? You know, if I had a nose, which was a little bit more pointed and bigger, then I might be more geared towards desert environments where there's more dust and stuff like that. So biology is one of those things that you need to consider also. I'm not sure how I took that left turn onto that topic. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is that if it comes down to shit hits a fan, the natural law is going to replace the artificial law that we created. And all this abundance, all this technology, all our domestication is not gonna count for shit unless you're really young. And that's why you see a lot of these apocalypse TV shows, the, the teeny bopper ones, you know, where they show all the only people who survived were the kids. Well, there's probably some truth to that because they, you know, it, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. I know there's gonna be people who say, yeah, you're as young as you feel, come on, come on, man. You know, I'm getting up there too. I can start to, I can start to call old people on their bullshit pretty soon because I'm catching up to you. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think in the comment section, please give this video a big thumbs up. It helps me out with the algo and uh, please comment, share your comments, share your feedback below and stay tuned because I have a great video coming up for you all about the storage of foods. And if you happen to stumble across a big cache of food five years, 10 years into the dystopian future, is it gonna be safe to eat? We're gonna talk about it. Thanks for watching guys, Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. Your one-stop shop for premium, high-quality, brand-name products that have been tried and tested by myself and other YouTube gear reviewers. My subscribers save 10% off by using the coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER. All one word in all caps.